Hi, I'm Reese Skiff. Uh, I've been a teacher for six years now. And last year, uh, at the end of uh, 2021 or 2020, I was one of the Kalman Teaching Fellows at uh, working through the University of Auckland. Uh, and it was really, it was really interesting. It maybe wasn't the, the best year uh, to do it just because, you know, we didn't actually get a lot of time to be able to go into the university. But even so, it was a really worthwhile experience. So if you're interested in spending more time at the university, I would, I would really recommend um, looking at the Kalman uh, Teaching Fellowship. Okay. Um, sorry, I still can't see the present. Oh, share screen. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. All right. Perfect. That should now be working. Uh, where is oh F5? Sorry, I've totally forgotten how to use. There we go. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, so this topic is on worked examples, self-explanation and engagement. Um, but first, core typing shang tokumanga. Um, this is my my mountain where I grew up in Hong Kong, uh, in a what was a little fishing village, but uh, is now not very good at fishing. I think. Uh, ko uh, Taihiki Toku Awa. Um, so that when we came to Hong, uh, came to New Zealand, I lived out in Waiopa uh, uh, near. Uh, I think most people know it for Spookers now, um, but this is a river that I, I really associate with my sort of upbringing. Uh, it's a very happy place. Ko Skiff. Uh, so this is my my big family uh, and my and my wife in the in the middle, who was going to become a music teacher, uh, but is now very happy not teaching. Uh, so while I love teaching, it's nice to know that it's not for everyone, and it takes a special kind of strange person uh, to to really get into it. Ko uh, Reese Tokuinoa. Now. I, at the end of uh, the sort of university program where they, they, they sort of prepare you to be a teacher, they ask you to do a learning journey. And for my learning journey, I thought, who are the people that I look up to and I want to emulate? And so here are two old gay men uh, that I really respected. And I thought, this is, this is the kind of teacher I wanna be. I wanna be someone who is relationally strong, who, who, who people want to turn to, to, to ask questions and to, have questions asked of them, um, never really giving the answer, but asking the right question at the right time. I went into teaching knowing that problem solving and inquiry was the best way to do it, that that's how you get the, the best outcomes. Uh, and I think there's nothing quite as strong as a novice's sense of um, belief in, in what they're doing. Quite quickly, uh, I came to sort of the, the reality that maybe it wasn't going as well as uh, I thought and that I needed to sort of uh, change the way I was working. I didn't want to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater, as it were, but I really wanted to, to help my students. You know, that was the, the sort of driving force behind, behind my teaching, not the idea of becoming Dumbledore or becoming Socrates. So before I get into the, the presentation proper, I do have some assumptions. Uh, that I'd like to share with you. And they are based on cognitive load theory, mostly. Uh, there's also a little bit of commognition, uh, which is an entirely different kind of kettle of, uh, of crazy, scary fish that I won't get into. Uh, but these are the three kind of main assumptions I'm making. That the idea of using a routine or skill um, is a particular so you can't sort of use it in a novel situation uh, unless you're comfortable with it the idea that problem solving requires us to do exactly this and that experts and novices think and learn differently so these are sort of the three assumptions uh, we can we can disagree at this but i think this is a sort of the foundational layer uh, of this uh, of my talk anyway so what is cognitive load theory um Cognitive load theory is, is really a way of thinking about how, how people think and how people learn. The idea being that in cognitive load theory that learning is a change in long-term memory. And so you can learn bad things and you can learn good things. You can learn bad habits and you can learn good habits. The learning itself isn't, uh, there's, there's no sense of good or bad. It's just a thing that happens. 
And so the idea with cognitive load theory is this, this the, the point of concern is the working memory. And, and how can we set this limited resource to the things that have the, the sort of biggest impact? And so the words they use are extraneous load uh, and optimizing intrinsic load. So the idea of the extraneous load is uh, not using too many words or uh, not confusing students with, with maybe words that they don't understand or parts of the problems that seem extraneous. That's the word. Intrinsic load is what's the thing that I want my students to learn? What am I actually asking them to, uh, to commit to a long-term memory? What's the important skill? Now, a lot of this stuff is from Oliver Lovell's book. I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, my picture, uh, but uh, it's his uh, synthesis of John Sweller's cognitive load theory. That's cognitive load theory in action. It's a really practical book. Um, I've also recently got his tips, uh, tools for teachers. And that's another really practical book of things that you can put into practice. Okay, I think now there is an example. Yes. Okay, so this is from Daniel Willingham's book. And I would like you guys to spend uh, maybe a minute, I will time it, having a go at this problem. Uh, so, and then I'm going to randomly ask one of you to sort of feedback on not only just what did you get, but also uh, how did you go with this problem? Okay, I'm going to start my timer for one minute. Okay, so hopefully my prompt uh, was enough to for all of you guys to 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 engage. Uh, I'm not actually going to ask one of you at random to tell me what the answer is, but would somebody like to offer up uh, their solution and how it felt doing this problem? Hi, Sue. Hi. Um, I can say how I did it. I can't remember if that's what yeah, you're asking. Yeah, I think yeah, I put yeah. A, is that right? A on three and then B on two and then A from three to two and then C to three and then A to one and then B to three and A to three. I don't know how many that is. <laughs> is, that <laughs> is that the first? Is that the first way that you, you tried to do it? Um, I made, when I started, yeah, no, that was okay, yeah. All right, for, so for a lot of our students, the, when I give them this problem, uh, what, sorry, thank you, Sue, that, that is the right answer. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. What a, a lot of our students do is they just try to put things on three straight away and you get that immediate feedback that, oh, this isn't working. Uh, and so it is quite nice. It's always really easy to see uh, what's going on visually it's quite clear and uh, you're not having to keep too many things in mind uh this next problem is the opposite end of the scale oh i'm not actually in there perfect so i'm going to give it just a just a minute to to read through this problem and remembering that often in a classroom a teacher will just say this they won't have it written down
Okay. I would give this to my students after the, the previous uh, activity. And I remember doing it once in a student uh, sort of guffawed out loud and said, sir, every time I read a sentence, the previous sentence disappears from my brain. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better way of describing the sort of overload on, on working memory. And while I don't actually want you guys to, to do this necessarily, I hope hopefully it sort of does show the, the, the impact of having something that is quite clear to see compared to something that is obfuscated and confusing. When in reality, this problem is, uh, can be represented like this, it can be reformulated in exactly the same way as the previous problem. When we are novices, uh, it's really hard to, to see this, but if we've seen problems like this over and over and over again, we can say, and this is what experts often do, oh, this is like this thing, I can use these skills to try to solve this problem. You'll hear mathematicians in particular talk about this a, a lot. Oh, if I think about the problem like this, I remember watching Andrew Wiles's, the, the documentary on Andrew Wiles and the uh, for Mars Last Theorem, where a lot of what he's doing is exactly this kind of thing. So working memory is really important. So when we're asking students to do something, we're asking them to pay attention to things and we wanna make sure they're paying attention to the, to the right things. So what does that look like for novices and experts? Um, there's a thing in cognitive load theory called the expertise reversal effect. Um, I've got a couple of quotes there from uh, Ollie Lovell, um, but the most uh, kind of important thing here is, is the idea that for novices, uh, problem solving tasks are unhelpful um, that uh, Dylan William sort of talks about how they will uh, actually increase the, the, the achievement gap in your classroom, because there are some students, the students who tend to put their hands up when they're asked, or who knows, uh, who will be comfortable with these and so we'll get a chance to practice it and then there will be some students who've never seen uh, this, you've never seen the skills that you need to use to solve the problem. Uh, in order to engage with it. So we need to be really careful with actually when we're doing new material, what's the best way to go about it? And not saying that necessarily problem solving is ineffective, just that there are much more effective things that are also uh, more equitable. Okay, uh, I, I've said a lot at the moment, maybe I can just take a, take a break before we get into the next part and just ask, does anybody have any, any questions? I don't have a question so much, Rose, but I use that idea of novices when I'm talking about statistics as well. And it's that same idea is that experts are able to write better or do, you know, the experience that they have makes that ability to write about the stats so much um, easier. And so it's that idea of also giving them those opportunities to become experts. And so if we don't ever expose them to these types of ideas they don't then move up either so yeah yeah uh, the example oh sorry the example that i often use um, with my students is chess um, when you're learning chess you're constantly worried about uh, what are the rules can i move my piece like this and you very seldom look at what the other person's doing and then eventually you start to look at what they're doing and then with experts they stop thinking about individual pieces and they start chunking areas of the board and looking ahead so the way that these sort of novices and, and experts are engaging with the same game are very different. And as you say, Pip, the way that people get good at things is with practice and specifically with intentional practice, but practice uh, in and of itself is, is a really good thing. And so how do we give our students practice? Ah, oh, good segue. Okay, uh, this is just a little bit of research on, on, on how important and how effective direct instruction is. Uh, if you're interested in, more in direct instruction, especially around um, literacy and teaching literacy with direct instruction. So I'm just listening to a really good podcast at the moment, uh, which is really, really, really clear. So it's, again, it's Oliver Lovell and it's with Lorraine Hammond, who is a, works in Australia and is, it's an excellent po uh, podcast about, about what's going on and how, how do you actually do explicit direct instruction. But this was really powerful. This is this is the sort of moment in my teaching where I thought, ah, I need to change things. I was wrong. And my sort of fundamentally held belief of problem solving is good is actually probably harming a lot of my students. 
And so obviously I swapped, swapped to the other side and said, problem solving is bad and, uh, and direct instruction is good and we need to always do that. Uh, and what I found is that a lot of students got very bored in my class and, uh, and became very demotivated. And so what I wanted to do was find uh, a middle ground. Okay, so in explicit direct instruction, you get this, this thing of um, I do, we do, you do. And one of the best practitioners of this is Eddie Wu. Uh, he's so good at not only being clear with what he's saying, reducing that external uh, extraneous cognitive load, but also pulling his students into the conversation. Now, I will say that he often does uh, he does the sort of hands up. So he's letting students contribute when they feel comfortable. But because of his classroom norms, a lot of his students feel very comfortable offering answers even if they're wrong. This is what I thought worked examples were. Uh, I thought a worked example was you articulate and you explain very clearly how you solved a problem. And then you give the students a bunch of, a bunch of questions. But uh, when people talk about worked examples are really effective in terms of helping students learn things, uh, they're not talking about this in, in cognitive load theory or direct instruction. Um, for students, especially novices, even questions which are very similar are completely foreign. They are as if you are giving them a problem solving task. Just changing the numbers can be sufficient to throw a student off. And what they're looking at so this is, a, I actually made this resource for, for, for number for year nine and 10, uh, only to find that it was not really effective and that the students weren't getting as much out of it as I had hoped. This is the MCAT, uh, I can't remember which year it's from, but the MCAT's really, really good for worked examples um, because it gives you the A and the B paper, which are almost identical. So they change a couple of things, but the questions are very, very similar. And with a good worked example, it's a worked example and then a problem that they that the students do. So the idea being that it's one to one and there's research um, I can I think it's in the the, the, the footnotes or the, the references at the end of this, which says that it's actually better for students in terms of uh, in terms of their retention, their longer term retention to do five questions when five of them have been done by you than eight questions if two of them have been done by you. So they are better able to sort of optimize their intrinsic load. They're not worried about what are the rules of chess. They're just getting to practice playing chess. So my, uh, the Kalman Fellowship program was looking at uh, how do I do worked examples? Uh, and so I read uh, Michael Pershing's book, um, basically teaching with examples. And, and he pointed me to this resource, which is by the SERP Institute. Um, which has two books. So there's uh, two PDFs, which are totally free. Uh, they are for a US context um, and they are just in maths and algebra. And I know one of the things that I was, talk uh, I, I was talking about at the presentation for this earlier was doing something like this for statistics, which I think is completely possible. Uh, it's just, there's not one yet. So I might, uh, hopefully this will go to it. So you, yeah, a lot of it here, there's, there's the download free materials. There's tens and tens and tens of pages of, uh, of examples. Now, the way that, um, this, this is really, really exciting, but it's not in the context, uh, yep, yeah, here we go. It's not in the context of New Zealand. So things do need to be true a little bit. Uh, you'll see with the, with the way they do it, they have one incorrect and one correct solution, um, which is um, according to the research, actually quite good for students to see uh, non-examples and examples, especially when the non-examples are misconceptions, common misconceptions, or um, you know that they focus on sort of necessary conditions for things. Uh, for example, uh, if I'm looking at an animal and I'm saying this is a bird, um, then it has to satisfy certain sort of criteria that it's, it has um, or it's warm-blooded, that it has feathers. Um, that it lays eggs. So if someone says, well, what about a bat? And you can say, well, that doesn't have the X and Y are there or it's not a bird. Now I gave this to my students and uh, they were overwhelmed, uh, to put it bluntly. There's just so much going on in, on this page. So what we have, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we have a worked example where Pablo is not solving something correctly. 
we have a question in the middle, which is um, what's called a self-explanation prompt, which is asking the student to reflect on and articulate something about the worked example. And then they have the you do, the chance for them to try to solve the same kind of problem. Um, and you'll notice the numbers are very, very similar. Like I said, for, for novices, it's really easy for students to feel like it's totally different. Okay. And what I liked about these is that they provided a, a bridge between the students in my class who got a lot out of explicit direct instruction, the, the sort of the people for whom um, the skill was completely novel, and the people who had experience with it. It's, it's quite a big step up from being able to do something um, as compared to being able to articulate, explain it, or, or have a conversation about it. And this is particularly important given that uh, for the numeracy co-requisite, uh, our students are going to have to do this. You know, if we think about the formulate, use, and sort of explain, justify, articulate, they, they will have to do this. And so again, like Pip said earlier, giving them the opportunities to do so is really, really important. Uh, I'd like to sort of show you the way that I've been going about this. So the first thing I do is I've just stripped out um, one of the, the examples when I will give it to students. Um, I'll often as well have a very simple hey mahi, and I can show you that actually. Um, <clears throat> so this is my note. Here we go. Uh, okay, so this is the current way. I have a, a sort of template at the moment that I use in uh, what I, I use good notes. Um, so I use the iPad to draw on this. So the question will be at the top. The self-explanation points will be down the bottom and then it will zoom out again. So I'm constantly worried about what are my students paying attention to? And I don't want them sort of jumping ahead because students inevitably just want to jump ahead and have a go. So I've taken one of the questions from the algebra, um, algebra by example book. There's the, uh, the worked example, the self-explanation prompts and then a, a, a chance for them to have a go. Before that, um, I wonder if good notes, are you guys seeing, oh, screen sharing is paused. That's because I just tried to do, um, sorry, let me, new share, that's what I want to do, okay. So this is the program I use on, on my iPad, and this just beams to the whiteboard uh, through HDMI or the Apple TV. And so on the left-hand side, I've got some worked examples for the students. This is for, for year 13, sort of gearing them up for simultaneous equations, yay. Uh, and then some examples for them, right? Because what I don't want them doing is, is trying to remember the rules of chess. I want them to practice chess. So I've got an example on the left-hand side. So they're having to do a lot of the the self-explanation while they're doing it. Oh, what does the minus three mean? What does the over two mean? But then I'll I'll launch into um, this here, All right? So I'll give them an opportunity to engage with some work that I've done and some of the language that I'm using. And I'll say things like, you have two minutes to read through the example and think about question one. Then I'm gonna give you a minute to talk to the person next to you uh, about question one, uh, after which I'm gonna ask one of you at random. And I've got a deck of cards with their names on it. And so I'll just ask them about it. Now, if they get it, if they don't say anything, um, two things will happen. Uh, I will say, I'm going to come back to you. And then after the conversation, I'll go and talk to the person next to them and just say, hey, I asked I asked so-and-so a question. They weren't able to ask it. How was your conversation? What were you guys talking about? So trying to keep each other, uh, keep students accountable for each other which is one of the sort of key points of, of AFL, for activating students. So working through it bit by bit before finally giving them a chance to have a go. And so this is sort of after the fact. Okay. Uh, not that one. New share. Oh yeah, we're in Safari, aren't we? So what I wanted to sort of 
ask you guys about today and I ask you sort of to think about is how can we use these because they aren't sort of cure all the you know panaceas of resources but they for me anyway they do provide a really good way of helping students with those uh those, those sort of the 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 justify the explain questions uh for the numeracy standard if we want students to be able to explain we need to give them opportunities to practice but also to practice explaining and to practice explaining in full sentences um, often as teachers we will give them the full sentence or we'll say is uh, is seven a prime number and uh, the student will say yes and the teacher will sort of say why and then the students may say well that has two factors seven and one but that's not a full sentence. The student's not getting practice with saying or answering full sentences. They're getting practice with uh, doing a question and answer with the teacher. So giving the students the opportunity to write or to answer, uh, you know, using their voice. So this is something that I, I thought would be quite helpful using these these skills and has been quite helpful. Obviously, students don't want to write, um, so getting them to articulate verbally first I found quite helpful the second thing is is the literacy aspect now just like uh just like as mathematics teachers we uh we teach maths we don't necessarily teach numeracy English teachers uh you know they teach literature they they teach analysis they don't necessarily teach literacy uh and but there is stuff that we can do as math teachers, and I know that's sort of the impetus that actually all teachers are teachers of literacy. Um, there are things that we can do to, to support it. Um, simply put, giving students the chance to write in full sentences or answer in full sentences. Um, my big concern with, with a focus on literacy is that as a subject teacher, I'm always going to prefer that students spend time paying attention to subject specific knowledge. Um, that's different if it's the case that the way students articulate is subject specific knowledge. Uh, but, uh, you know, so if I'm going to give students feedback on uh, whether or not they're using full stops and capital letters at the start of sentences, uh, that's a secondary kind of, of feedback. And I may talk to the class about this week, I'm focusing on these things. But one of the things that Oli Lover talks about in this is actually specifically, why do students forget to use a full stop? Uh, and I want to, I sort of add uh, verbatim, I've copy and pasted his response to that. And it's all about this idea of, of cognitive load and sort of overloading our, our work memory with an example of beginning or novice teachers and, and expert teachers. And I'll give you a moment to, sort of read through this. There's a lot there, apologies.
this example for me was really quite powerful um, and emphasized not only that uh, the way that novices and experts think about things is different, but that if what I care about is students using full stops at the end of sentences, that in and of itself is something they need to practice and trying to tack it onto, to, onto the end of something that they're also trying to learn uh, is a recipe for disaster. Um, students need practice just like teachers need practice. Um, and I thought this, this example was a really, really powerful one. Uh, how many, sorry, Mala, how many of us are there? Um, I've got um, a, a eight, 18 of us. 18. Yes. Would it be possible to have uh, in a moment, but not quite yet, uh, some breakout rooms just to sort of discuss? I'm looking for basically very general feedback at this stage uh, with respect to with respect to the literacy requirement, with respect to numeracy, and also just how you might use this resource in your classroom, um, the resource being um, this here. So Ma, are, are we able to go into uh, I, I breakout, get, rooms? breakout rooms? How many do you want? Uh, uh, maybe six of three. I think three in a, in a group is a, a good number. Okay. You wanna include the so, co-hosts or do, should we have five and then? Yeah, five sounds good, and we can we can dip in and out. So I think maybe maybe yeah, ten minutes. The question being, how would you use this in your classroom, especially with respect to numeracy uh, and the literacy prerequisites? Okay, so I'll create them now. Yes, please. Thanks, Pip. Okay. Thanks, Pip. I've just moved people around so that cool. all, room five was not, didn't have many people on it. So I've just jumped them around. Expert. That's cool. Everyone's got at least two of them to have the conversation. That's awesome. Oh, excellent. Yeah, my, my initial hope for this was, was to be in person and actually getting people, you know, having more of a conversation and doing the, 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 the making of the resources. Yeah. Um, but you know, a wee pivot once I once I realised that it was online. Yeah. Hey, um, Ray, we've got HOD mm -hmm. day coming up. Do you think you'd be able to present there? Because this would be the sort of thing that would be really cool for MU holders and stuff in terms of thinking about what they're doing for, um, you know, getting ready for numeracy. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be I'd be more than happy. Do you um do you have the do you know where the link is to? I can find the link. Um, to offer a workshop. Mm. So here. Um, I'll drop the link in for the thing and then you, there's just a um, a link there to okay, just perfect. register. Oh, in the chat? I'll, yeah, I'll do it. I'll give I'll you the just, link yeah, yeah. to the no page. I'll put it in the chat. Cool. And then you can, um, when you go into there, there's a submit your workshop abstract here. So it's on the first okay. slide. So that would be, I think, really Perfect. cool. Um, when I gave this uh, a, sort of a truncated version of this talk uh, at uni, um, Lisa was there. And she was talking about um, taking this and, and using it with statistics and sort of yeah. um, tossing around what that might look like. Um, and that was sort of, quite quite cool because I have tried it a little bit with statistics um, and one of the problems we have at Ruskell and I'm sure other teachers have it as well is that at the moment all of the explain questions tend to be merit and excellence yeah 
And so go, going into numeracy, the students who need the practice the most are the students who are currently getting the least practice with it. So, um, yeah, so that might be something that at some stage, maybe you and I can sit down and have a think about it as well. Because, you know, I don't know if you know, but that's my area that I work in. Um, and we could possibly connect you up with some other people around the country. So do you know Michelle Dalrymple or do you know who she is? The name is very familiar. Yeah, so she's, um, and then Dave Phillips is another person that um, do, uh, both, yeah, Mark Hooper's another one. Um, yes, yeah, so there's probably quite a few stats people that have got that. Sophie, of course, is a, another person who- <laughs> Yeah. Very interested in stats. Um, so, but yeah, um, give me a give me an email, you know, when you want to have a look at it um, again, cool. and I'll see how we go. Um, I don't know how long they've been in for. Maybe give them another another three minutes. Are we able to to bounce around the the group? Yes, you you should be able to just click on the breakout rooms Oops. down the bottom. Yeah, Can you see that? that? Uh, we yeah, go to sorry, share um, screen. Mm -hmm. So if you go down, if you, you get the share, oh no, you're at the top. So if you go to where the, the toolbar is at the top, you should be able to choose it from there. But maybe if you just stop sharing, <laughs> I can explain it to you more easily. Sorry, uh, if, stop sharing. So oh, move your mouse up to the top of the screen, usually is where it comes up. Oh yeah, here it is, here it is, yeah. okay. So if you now go down to the bottom, there should be a little button that says breakout rooms. Yeah, sorry, I've, I've only ever really used this on the iPad. Yeah, so if you click on the breakout rooms, you should then be able to see which one you want to join. All right, lovely. I might give them a, a, a warning. Yeah, we should better. Are you going to do that? Tell them. Yeah, how long I can do that. Yep. Perfect. Broadcast. All right, I'm going to hop in now. Three Thanks minutes. Me. And then I'll, well, I think when I close it, I'll close it in two because I think that gives them a minute warning. Perfect. All right, people are starting to come back. Hey, Donna. Ah, hello, Pip. How are you? <laughs> How are you? Good. Good to see you on. I know. Long time no see. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good to join. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, we have them once. Uh, oh, she's gone. <laughs> oh no, you haven't. You've have moved somewhere else. And um, we have them once a term. Oh God. Yeah. So now that you've registered, you'll get the information. Okay. And they're open, obviously, to so any of your teachers that you deal with, just let them know about it. 
Yeah, I, I sent it across all our clusters of schools and our secondary clusters as well. So great. I, I sent it out. <laughs> That's very cool. All right. I'll all be back in 13 seconds, according to my timer. Yeah, they should all come now. Okay. It looks like people are coming back in. Yeah, they 17 people now. have come back in, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I, the way I've sort of timed this is uh, hopefully we've got a little bit of time now to, to feedback. I did uh, pop into a couple of break room, breakout rooms and I heard some really interesting things being being shared and questions being asked. So it, it, if, we, if you don't have anything that you would like to say from your breakout room, that's okay. Uh, but if there is something you would like to say, that would be really appreciated. So maybe we can start with breakout room one. Um, so Estelle, uh, would you like to go? Um, and then uh, Tina, both of you had some very interesting um, observations. Uh... Oh, Estelle, I think I, you're I think mute. you need to unmute Estelle. We can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, so everything, um, well, just using that example of um, a hey mahi, for example, um, and I guess I struggle with the time that's required um, to get students to annotate their work or have full sentence about describing their work. Um, but certainly um, as, a, as a way of, I just don't think that that um, exam, working that way is more than five minutes, is more than a five minute, uh, a hey mahi kind of um, piece of work to have that kind of discussion about which um, most students need. Um, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Estelle, I just that like on that. See, it resonates. Sorry. I was going to say, I, I actually tried these as hey mahi, and it just fell completely flat on its face for the reason you're talking about. It just takes too long. Uh, and sort of having those conversations were really, really difficult. Um, so uh, I, I ended up moving away from it, having simpler, shorter, sharper uh, hey mahi before, if it were the thing that I were doing that lesson, before moving into the example problem pairs with the, the self-explanation prompts. And for me, I, I'm not yeah. doing them every day uh, either. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, what I've noticed is we've used this year, and I'm only third year teacher, so I'm really new at this. I, and that little paragraph that you've made us read I went it's so true um I kind of I have my own cognitive overload going on while I'm trying to impart the um important parts of kind of the learning or the takeout from the um the lesson which will change now that I've seen this but I don't know that I know that what you've explained is is the key to unlocking long-term memory because they don't remember the the repetition in the numbers at all they'll only remember what they've rewrote in their head in English yeah <laughs> you know um, I mean. yeah no, Daniel Willingham has got this really lovely quote um, where he says that memory is the residue of thought uh, yeah. the idea being that, that we we pay we remember what we pay attention to um, yeah. 
yeah and, and yeah yeah so yeah. um in in the short in a nutshell knowing that it's only once a week or less is probably helpful i still try i don't know how to get the girls to well my students to do that as a habit but i'm certainly working on it consistently i guess hmm. Yeah. yeah. Tina, do you want to quickly share what you were saying? I think, I think I'm a skilled student and teacher. I didn't have like have the real class now. So all my thinking just based on the theory. So um, I think it's best to ask students to explore first and then um, give them the guidance and then ask them to practice. So in this way, students will have more like because they think about it and then they will more have a deeper uh, memorize it about it and then they can understand and they can solve it and use it. Well, cool. thanks, Tina. Um, I think one of the one of the things about that, uh, and maybe this is to, to Estelle's point, is that for a lot of students, um, just getting them to think about it in the first place, if they're not sure what they're thinking about, is really, really challenging. Um, and it's a it is a battle, especially for those kids who, for very rational reasons, will opt out or will choose to choose to, will choose to think about something else because they have uh, like a lot of prior experience with not doing well in in maths. So for those students who are disengaged or unmotivated, it can be really tricky to to get them to think about these sort of uh, these kind of skills. While um, and this is maybe something else that uh, came up in another group. Uh, what I'm not saying is that explicit direct instruction and self-explanation prompts will solve all of our problems or that they are better than um, simple hey mahi or that they're better than a low floor high ceiling tasks. Um, what I'm hopefully saying is that I was wrong in the past. I was wrong to think that problem solving was the be all and end all. And I was wrong to think that explicit direct instruction was the be all and end all. Um, and it, it if if I were to if if you guys were to take anything away from this uh, session, it is that experts and novices are different, and that there is a place for explicit direct instruction. There is a place for problem solving, and a bridge between those two things is worked examples or example problem pairs and self explanation prompts. So that's why um, I'm not using them all the time. That's why I'm not doing low floor high ceiling tasks all the time. Um, because I'm trying to be as as dynamic and and um, responsive as I possibly can be in the classroom. Um, 